Good evening. Um, I'm going to now call the meeting to order at 7.13 p.m. Um, welcome to the PVUSD board meeting, um, special board meeting for Wednesday, June 12th, um, 2024. We have translation in Spanish. If you need that support, please see Urania Lopez for that. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la Juente Directiva de PVUSD. Disponemos de tradición en español. Si necesita ese apoyo, consulte a Yorania López. Um, if someone would like to speak to an item on the agenda, they must complete a speaker card and hand it to Eva Renteria. And each speaker will have two minutes. Um, I will now ask um, trustee Dr. Holm to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. And now I will move us to item 3.3. Dr. Heather Contreras, our superintendent, will um, now make a few comments under 3.3 superintendent comments. Good evening, and thank you for coming to our meeting this evening. Um, just wanted to share some of the work that we've been doing over the last couple weeks since the last board meeting. Uh, thank you for all of you who have come to voice your thoughts and concerns around ethnic studies. We have formed a committee of teachers and administrators who will be identifying what are our needs to address, uh, address training for the ethnic studies curriculum. Um, and for teachers and administrators, mainly focusing on the administrators. Uh, that committee will be meeting over the course of several meetings to examine next step options so that we can still continue to provide the training that our administrators would like to engage in. I also went out to PV High School and uh, Jenny M, our interim CBO, and Claudia Monjeres, our um, assistant superintendent of elementary education, joined me. And we met with students who we had personally invited. They were all students who had spoken at board meetings over the last months. So we personally invited them to come and meet with us. We had pizza and we talked about the different concerns that the students had brought forward. Um, the students reported they felt it was a beneficial meeting and we all agreed that we would be holding these meetings in the future three times a year. Uh, so that they had the opportunity to talk to district office personnel about things on their mind and concerns. And we'll be doing that at all of the comprehensive high schools as well as alternative education high schools as a best practice moving forward for next year. So it was an exciting meeting. It's great to talk to our youth. They're great ideas that they have um, and how we can get better at what we're doing. Also attended all uh, high school graduations over the last week, wonderful events. I wanna compliment our principals and their teams as well as our maintenance and operation. They were amongst the most beautiful graduations that were student-centered, community-centered, uh, that I've ever been a part of. And I feel like that says a lot because I've been to a lot of graduations. So uh, really great for the team, great for the community, a lot of success out there with our students. So it was just a really great way to end the year. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. Um, now I will move us to item 3.4, governing board comments, reports on standing committees. This is the opportunity for each board member to make a few comments. And we will start with Trustee Bolano Scow. Thank you very much, President Acosta. Welcome everybody, uh, to everybody here in the room, everybody watching. I just got a couple of, of things to say. I attended the graduations at Pajaro Valley High School, Watsonville High School, and Aptos High School. I wanna congratulate all the graduates, all the families, all the staff who uh, made it happen. All three went very, very well. And of course, uh, I was particularly proud of the musical presence at the, at the graduations, um, the bands at Watsonville High School, uh, the Pajaro Valley uh, band was amazing, um, playing live in tune, and the Aptos High Choir, uh, top notch as they always are. So uh, congratulations to all the families, thanks to all of our staff, all the teachers, everybody 
who supported uh, these kids in their graduation. Uh, also want to give a shout out to Cabrillo College for hosting a very successful mariachi festival. Their first mariachi festival was hosted uh, by Cabrillo College's VAPA department on Sunday. Our kids with Mariachi Ilusión and the Pajaro Valley High School mariachi band performed. It was awesome. The UC Santa Cruz band played. The Cabrillo plan played. So the kids are going to see their ability to, to advance. Uh, it was just a really wonderful coming together. And of course, who doesn't love mariachi music? And if you don't know you love it, you will love it someday. And I also want to give a shout out to uh, Watsonville Charter School for the Arts and teacher Bobby for his uh, production of SpongeBob the musical. I was blown away. I think he had 30 kids on there singing the same time in tunes. Very, very impressive. And also to uh, teacher Susanna Blake at Lakeview Middle School, Middle School, who's been building the program there from the bottom up, um, doing an amazing job uh, with their performance as well. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Contreras for those uh, meetings she just mentioned. Having meetings at the high school for our kids is innovative, smart, brilliant idea. I think it's a, a very important uh, to, to having good communication and have our students feel heard. So thank you for doing that. All right, that's it. Thank you, Trustee Pilano Scow. We'll now move to Trustee Deserpa. Thank you. Well, this um, time of the year is very, very special um, for families, uh, for our students who are graduating. Um, I want to say congratulations to all the graduates. Um, we're so super proud, especially of our um, student trustee, Ruby, um, who's going to a great school next year, Brown University. We all wish her uh, the best. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Trustee Dr. Hall. Thank you. I also attended multiple graduation and promotion events since our last meeting. And when I worked at Watsonville Community Hospital, I worked in the intensive care nursery. And I'm at the point now where I am offering graduation congratulations to young adults that I took care of when they were tiny, fragile infants. As a nurse, I don't always get to know how the story ends. Uh, but getting to see how this chapter of their lives turned out, that was pure joy. And I also want to extend my heartfelt appreciation to the classified, certificated, and administrative staff that worked together to ensure that our students were honored on their special days. We don't have very many formal rites of passage. Um, and these ceremonies are a big deal. And while we had some challenges, um, and we'll certainly work to improve where needed, what I was left with was a deep sense of appreciation for everyone involved, whether you, know, you were reading names off or ensuring that students were in the right place or that the venue was clean and welcoming. You all did an amazing job, so thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Trustee Flores. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. And I want to also congratulate all of our graduates um, for their accomplishments and wish them the best of luck in their next journey. I was not able to attend um, s several of the graduations. I was able to go to WCSAs uh, because my son did graduate eighth grade there. Um, that was really exciting. And I also was able to uh, see the SpongeBob musical, and I encourage anyone to come out and, you know, anytime the Mellow Center is hosting um, any arts events, it, it's always a blessing. It's the symphony, the, the, any program that they have there. So thank you, uh, Trustee Scott, for attending that and showing your support. Um, and I just wanted to say uh, thank you again for the meetings that uh, Dr. Contreras was having at our high schools. I think it's a great idea, and I would love to be invited to one in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Flores. Trustee Vice President So. Right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. A uh, couple things. I know we just had Memorial Day just pass, and I hope you took a moment to reflect on uh, the sacrifices made by those individuals to allow us to do the things that we do in this country, um, like wearing attire from another country and representing something you know, that's allowed in this country that you might not be able to do somewhere else. Uh, I wanna wish all the fathers out there a happy Father's Day. I'll be celebrating with my four this Sunday. And I wanna also uh, congratulate all the graduates and uh, Congratulate them and wish them luck in their future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Vice President Soto. 
Um, so I um, just want to commend everyone in our PBUSD um, for a wonderful um, celebratory great graduation season that we had here in PBUSD. Um, I want to congratulate all of our PBUSD graduates. Um, we had a total of 20, right, if I counted, 10 high schools and 10 promotion ceremonies, I believe it was, I think was the number. Um, and congratulations to all our eighth graders on their promotions. And I want to, of course, extend the heart felt thanks to our certificated teachers who have brought our students to these point, different points in their educational journey. And a very special thank you to our classified staff, particularly our staff in maintenance, operations, and facility. And I see our director, Herlindo, here. And a huge shout out to him and his staff because these graduations and promotion ceremonies could not take place with all the additional hours of work and support from them. So I just want to say thank you to our MNO team. You're phenomenal. Um, thank you so much. Um, and then um, I also just want to extend um, a th um, happy Father's Day to Trustee Dodge Jr., um, who isn't here this evening, has an excused absence, and um, Trustee Vice President Soto, wishing both of you a very happy Father's Day, and to extend that very happy Father's Day to all the fathers in our PVUSD community and beyond. Next, I will move us to item 4.1, the approval of the agenda. And we need to amend the agenda, um, the language for item um, number nine, to state visitor agendized items, as this is a special board meeting and public comment at special board meetings is limited to agendized items only. So I will make a motion to approve the agenda, amending the language of agenda item number nine to visitor agendized items only. Can I have a second? I'll second. I have a first and a second. All those Quick in Point of order. Um, so with, we don't necessarily have to limit it for special board meetings. Correct. That, that's us our usual practice, but that we do not. It is our practice, and it is in the policy that the purview is to be under just the agendized items. So, I have a first and a second at this point. So we have a first to approve the agenda with a motion to approve the agenda, amending the language under item nine. It was a misrepresentation from staff, an error. This is a special board meeting, and the public comment is limited to visitor agendized items only, as I'm sure you well know, Trustee Dr. Holm being past president twice. I am aware. I'm also aware of what the, the Brown Act says is permissible. And we have a we do have a past practice, but we posted the agenda as if we were allowing public comment. So I, I it, it was I, an oversight on staff's part. I, un I understand. So we have a first and we have a second to approve the agenda with that. So I will call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Nay. Aye. I mean, nay. I mean, we're voting. Yeah. Can, we, can we ask a question? Sure. Can you put your. Would it be possible to, because this one was posted this way, maintain that, but then for our next special, like going forward for special ones, go back to our past practices? Or are we, are we saying that if we do this now, then we have to do this going forward? That's, that's my question. The board's legal counsel in past has said that we should continue with our past practice and not change that unless that's brought before the board. I'm understanding that this was an error. So we're trying to amend the area. Point of order, you have to post it 72 hours in advance. You want another lawsuit and waste more money, girl? Come on. I'm sorry, Trustee Bel I'm sorry. Hold on. Before I bring it back, Trustee Belonskow, did that answer your question? Um, yeah. Okay. Well, it's the same question, same point. I, I do feel, in general, I like giving the chance, the public, having the chance to have a public comment is important. 
given that it was posted that way, I would prefer that we keep it that way for tonight. That would be my preference. I just and I'm and it, I'm hearing two things on the legal side. I'm here, and so I, we don't have a lawyer here to clarify. Given that, but it just I'm just going by your experience here. My preference would be that we have public comment since it was posted that way. Oh, thank you, Trustee you, Bellano Scout. Yeah. Trustee DeSerpa. Um, I'd like a roll call vote. I'd like to hear the vote again and do roll call this time. And do you want to reread on the motion? Sure. Thank you. So the motion was made to approve the agenda, amending the language to item number nine to visitor agendas items only, as this is a special board meeting. That was first and seconded. And Evo, will you please help us with the roll call? Trustee DeSerpa, your vote? Nay. Trustee Bolaños, your vote? No. Trustee Flores, your vote? No. Trustee Holm, your vote? No. Vice President Soto, your vote? Aye. Good. President Acosta, your vote? Aye. Okay, so the motion failed. So then I will have to bring it back to the board for an approval of the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. I have a first. I'll second. I have a second. Eva, can you please assist us with a roll call on that? Trustee Skull, your vote? Yes. Trustee DeSerpa, your vote? Aye. Trustee Holm, your vote? Yes. Trustee Flores, your vote? Yes. Vice President Soto, your vote? Aye. Yes. And President Acosta, your vote? Yes. And that will carry on 601. Uh, now we have an approval of the May 8th, 2024 special board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion to approve the May 8th, 2024 board meeting minutes? I move to approve. A second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seen. Sorry. <laughs> Abstaining? That will carry on a 6011. I'm sorry, 5011. Excuse me, Eva. Um, okay, a 6.1 report on closed session. Are there any items to report from closed session? Uh, yes, yes, we do. We're reporting that out. All right, on closed session. Uh, Item 2.1, there was no item. 2.2, .2, no item. Uh, closed session item 2.3, expulsion referral under closed session agenda item 2.3. Board voted 601 to approve the recommendation from district administration for a full expulsion for the remainder of the semester and next semester for student number 2324029 and student 2324031. Board also voted 601 to approve the recommendation from district administration for a suspended expulsion for student 232433. Uh, motion number one, closed session item 2.4. I move to approve certificated personnel report as presented by the district administration on June 12, 2024, with 39 and 23 additional action items. A second to approve. I've so moved. So we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. Motion number two, closed session item 2.5. Move to approve classified personnel report as presented by district administration on June 12, 2024 with 15 and seven additional action items. Do I have a second? I so move. <clears throat> I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. Closed session item 2.7 regarding resolution 232448. Board approved non reelection of 1.0 FTE certificated probationary employee number 10085. We need a motion for that, uh, President Acosta. I'll call for a motion. Make a motion. A second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? 
Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. Right, we have six announcements. Uh, announcement number one, PVUSD is pleased to announce the selection of Sarah Mora as a new assistant principal of Aptos Junior High School. Sarah has been working with students since 2009 and most recently as an education specialist at Aptos Junior High. She holds a BA in psychology from Bethany University and educational specialist credential from North Coast School of Education and is obtaining her admin credential via the Bridges to Leadership Program through the Madera County Office of Ed and will hold an an inter administrative cred credential in the fall. We're excited to welcome Sarah to her new role. Go Sea Dragons. Uh, announcement number two PVUSD is pleased to announce the selection of Cliff Livingston as the new academic coordinator of Watsonville Charter School of the Arts. Cliff's been working with the students since 2015 as an elementary school science release teacher and also has been a first grade teacher at both H.A. Hyde and Minnie White. Cliff holds a BEA. In, are from CSUMB and also earned his teacher credential from CSUMB. He's currently enrolled in the Bridges to Leadership program and will hold an intern administrative credential in the fall. We're excited to welcome Cliff to his new spot. Go Chameleons. Uh, announcement number three. PVUSD is pleased to announce the selection of Sarah Subiondo as a new assistant principal at Watsonville High School. Sarah began her teaching career at Aptos High in 2009, teaching US history, government, and economics. She also taught at Watsonville High and was also the English language specialist there. She has also held role, roles as a site administrator and the administrator of the youth building program with the Livermore Valley Joint Unified Districts. Sarah holds a BA of Arts from Pacific University and a single subject teaching credential from San Jose State, a Master of Arts in Educational Leadership and Administrative Credential from San Jose State, and a doctorate degree from Cal State, or sorry, California Institute of Integral Studies. We're excited to welcome Sarah to PVSD. Go Cats. Announcement number four. PVUSD is pleased to announce the selection of Denise Wheeler as the new academic coordinator from McQuitty Elementary School. Denise has been working with students since 2013, has spent her teaching career at McQuitty. During the, that time, she has served as a grade level lead, PBIS lead, and was the Saturday school lead teacher. Denise obtain, obtained her BA in interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary studies from Western Governors University. She holds a Master of Science in Educational Leadership and an Administrative Credential from Western Governors as well. We're excited to have a lifelong liquidity Mustang step into the administrator role. Go Mustangs. Announcement number five. PVUSD is pleased to announce the selection of Michelle Connery as the new academic coordinator for Bradley Elementary. Michelle has been serving students since 2015 when she started teaching first grade at Radcliffe Elementary. She also served as the early literacy coach at Radcliffe for the last two years. She holds a BA in liberal studies from CSUMB and also earned her multiple subject credentials from CSUMB. Michelle is currently working on her admin credential and will hold an intern administrative credential in the fall. We're excited to welcome Michelle to her new role, Go Bears. And number six, last but not least, uh, Pajaro Valley Unified District is pleased to announce the selection of Ricky Maldonado as the new assistant principal of Cesar Chavez Middle School. Mr. Maldonado has been serving the students of Pajaro Valley since 2016 as a social emotional counselor, assistant principal, and academic coordinator. He obtained his BA in Humanities from CSUMB, pupil personnel services credential from National University, and administrative credential from Santa Clara. He also holds a Master in Science Counseling from National University, and we're proud to welcome Ricky to his new administrative role. Go Warriors. Thank you, Vice President Soto. We'll now move to consent agenda. These are items that are routine, um, routine items coming before the board. Are there any public speakers to the consent agenda? We have none. Are there any items that the board would wish to defer? Seeing none, can I have a motion? I move to approve. Second. I have a first, I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 6-0-1. We'll now move to 9.1 public comment. 
And we, this is the opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for this evening. Please know that through the Brown Act prohibits the board from engaging in discussion for non agendized items, but we are listening and each speaker will have one minute. Do we have any public comments? Yes, we have a few and I'll call you at uh, groups of six, just come on up. Uh, Nwit Mann, Marilyn Garrett, uh, Bobby Mershaw, Gabe Medina, and uh, Goldie, is it Minas? Dr. Goldie Minas? I'm sorry? Jacques Main, sorry. Come on up, those six that I called. I thought I heard myself. Oh, that is louder. Uh, how long do we have? Just checking because this says two minutes on here and one minute up there. Just want to see where we're at tonight. It's one minute, sir. One minute tonight. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for uh, happy summer, everybody. Good to see you. Um, thank you, those of you who allowed us to, to speak tonight. I will say I was curious why we had a, a special meeting when I saw that email come through, and so I was surprised to hear that. So I appreciate you giving us a voice this evening. Um, also, Dr. Contreras, thank you for your update on the ethnic studies stuff. I will say I'm uh, cautiously optimistic. Gave me uh, some hope. But I will say I, I look forward to learning more. You know, who is put on that? How was that decided? Um, and also, I am just concerned that I, I hope that we are, you said, what are our next steps, but we didn't talk about, uh, is CRE part of, on the table for those next steps? And I think addressing what's happened over the last nine months of people showing up is a really important not to just brush under the rug and move forward. One thing I'd like to add to that committee uh, is I discovered that, you know, next year is the first year that our students have to have uh, ethnic studies. I have a son who's a senior, which is why I know, and I know that seniors are being told that some of them have to take that in summer school or after school because there are not enough classes to take it in the school day, um, which to me is a major concern as well as another just addresses our lack of, uh, I know you say you're supporting it even though you're doing this, but that needs to be addressed because we need to be giving that opportunity to our students if we need to have them graduate with it. Thanks. It states two minutes to speak on the agenda. There aren't many people here. It's clear you do not want the input of the public. Why are you there? This is a notice. Is Wi-Fi in school making your child sick? There's a whole list of symptoms. Headaches, migraines, dizziness, memory loss, etc. If so, your child may be suffering from radiation sickness. Microwave transmitters for wireless internet are installed in most schools. These devices are exposing your child to non-ionizing radiation for six hours per day, 184 days per year. Non-ionizing radiation has been concerned through thousands of scientific studies to cause all the above symptoms and chronic cumulative exposure can lead to serious life-threatening health problems such as cancer, leukemia, brain tumors, and diabetes. By the way, I filled out cards to speak on the consent agenda items and I was not called. Thank you. So just for the record, my grandfather was a veteran and fought for our freedom to self-expression. And are you so incredibly vapid that you cannot recognize your words and actions? You tried silencing the public, which goes against the freedom that my grandfather fought for. So why don't you think about the next time you say something so stupid? Um, let's see. Um, and 
you know, truth be told, Soto, to stand up, for, I want to stand up for the innocent, like my grandfather told me. And I remember, um, you know, he told me that it's self-loathing Latinos like yourself that are the lab dogs of the white woman. It's people like you, Soto, who embrace machismo, have homophobia, and it's people like you who make students uncomfortable. It's people like you who made me, a queer Chicano Latino, feel different uncomfortable and unwanted. And so you could recognize that that leads to mental health issues, which is something that you need to start focusing on. And I'm gonna stare you down to my minutes up. Cool. Good evening, board members, hello. I'm here to inform you about SB 760, a California law requiring schools to provide accessible all gender restrooms for students by July of 2026. I'm, I'm not aware of any PVUSD schools that currently meet this requirement. I'm a parent of a transgender child at Aptos High and he was promised gender neutral restrooms available, but this has not been adequately fulfilled. The existing restroom is in a remote location on campus. It's often locked and it's not easily accessible. Students have faced embarrassing situations like peeing their pants. They have avoided drinking water, suffered headaches, dehydration, and struggled with concentration due to a lack of bathroom access. SB 760 mandates that at least each school site has an all gender restroom that is clearly marked, unlocked, and accessible. I urge the board to prioritize and implementing gender neutral restrooms at all school sites to comply with this state law. Thank you for your time. All right, next six. It was, I'm sorry. Hello. Um, I was prepared this for two minutes, but that's okay, we can do one minute. So my name is Nguyen Man. I have been a full-time uh, career technical education teacher at Pajaro Valley High School since 2008. I have two CD credentials, technology, arts, and entertainment, and I currently teach graphic design video production. I also have a degree in computer science from UCSC. Recently, I was asked to teach three freshman seminar classes for next year, consistent health and life skills components, which would take up 60% of my time. Um, I don't think I can be a good CD teacher if the majority of my time is used in something else but CTE. I want to ask our HR leaders to utilize my expertise 100% in technology, arts, and entertainment. Um, I have expertise in the field of technology, arts, and entertainment. However, I know very little about health, so I respectfully ask for your support to let me teach career technical education 100% next year. Thank you so much. I will call the last group up. Chris Webb, Maria Garcia, Evan Maines, Nat Lowe, Eli Davies, Bobby Peltz, Mark Mendoza, and Bill Beecher. So at the last meeting, um, I, I approve of a board measure, or a bond measure, but um, I think it's a, not a good use of the money to spend it on something that's already been delivered for Renaissance, and that's a, a staff room. And um, actually, the student leadership group earlier in the school year, they did a survey of stakeholders at, at, the, at the site, the students and the staff, and they did a survey of the things that they would actually want. And they didn't get a chance to show their data, but I had, took the liberty of printing it out for them. So uh, you could see their top priority was mirrors and doors in the restroom. By the way, if you let the culture deteriorate and then you um, have vandalism and you punish all kids, Collective punishment, wrong. But that was a priority. Also, a Spanish room, high priority. Also, um, another, for, for like their second highest priority, an auto shop. We should be expanding CTE, things that kids are really interested. You want them to come to school, do things they're interested in. And I'll just show these just, to, just for the public to have the viewing of it, just for a moment here. Thank you.
Hello, members of the board. I'd like to speak to a topic that is very close to me as a transgender student today. Trans students deserve access to facilities that they need, and right now, at least at Aptos High, we do not have that access. Aptos High is a big campus, and despite having gender-neutral bathrooms, they are not easily accessible to students. There are currently two sex-segregated bathrooms that are under construction that would be ideal to change to, into more gender-neutral bathrooms. These bathrooms are centrally located in the D building above the quad, and there are students, sorry, there are adults posted outside nearby the bathrooms during break and lunch, so they're already under surveillance. The bathroom situation at Aptos High is so bad, many students do their utmost to avoid using bathrooms on campus, which is not healthy for them. California law SB 760 requires that all California public schools need to have easily accessible gender neutral bathrooms by July of 2026, and with the current remodeling right now is the perfect time to do so. Please consider opening up gender neutral bathrooms across all schools in PVUSD with a focus on them being just as, ac as accessible for students as the sex segregated bathrooms are. One minute is too short to talk. Give us more time. Hello, Board of Trustees. I am here again. Although it's summer, I won't stop coming until our voices are heard. One of my recent concerns are the lack of support to start having neutral, gender neutral bathrooms at schools. California law SB 760 states that all California public schools need to have easily, easily accessible gender neutral bathrooms by July 2026. Oh, but you guys already have gender neutral bathrooms in the nurse's office. No, the bathrooms in the nurse's office are not gender neutral bathrooms. LGBTQ youth need a space where they can go to do their business without worrying about being hurt. You guys have no idea how it feels like playing the news of LGBTQ youth being killed, assaulted, and bullied because of the lack of support we have. I want a safe place where I'm supposed to be growing and learning. Also, I want to point out the CRE meeting with students. Is this true? Because if so, why didn't me and my friends get invited? We've been here fighting for this since the start. And hi, Acosta, nice try, but you can't silence us. Next time you apply for a job, make sure you at least make one of the requirements. We won't back down, just know that. So I was going to talk about the CER contract, but I also wanted to talk about what just what Mark said. She basically, I saw bathrooms that were changed. They were gen, they were for both genders, and suddenly it said women and men, and that confused me. I was like, why why are you changing that? And it didn't make sense to me why they would change it. So. I'm questioning you guys because you guys are the ones in charge of all of this. So why, why do, why do, why all of a sudden does it say women and men when it said gender or neutral? It literally said it on the on on both sides. There were two, and then one of them said women, and one of them said men. We have enough of those. Why, why isn't there more? Because some of my friends are trying to convert, and they can't convert just because of the being bullied, all everything that they've gone through, and it just it's horrible knowing that that's what's been going on. And I'm just hoping that you guys see, I'm here during the summer, I could be doing something else, I could be sleeping right now, but I'm here. And I just, I just hope you guys understand that I'm here to help. Thank you. Listen to these brave student allies coming up for their friends, coming up for themselves. On the initial thing I was going to talk about, according to a recent Vox article, research at Stanford University and USC found that racial segregation in the country's 100 biggest school districts, which serve the most students of color, has increased by 64% since 1988. I went to two graduations last week, one in Aptos and one in Watsonville. Segregation in these schools is clear. Ethnic studies is an educational tool to resist racism. What is also clear is that this board already knows the next steps to implement admin training for ethnic studies, bring back the CRE contract. Listen to ethnic studies professors about this. They are all in agreement. On another a note, Acosta and Soto, you are being incredibly shady by trying to silence public comment at the last minute, and we will vote you out with Carol Turley and Gabriel Medina. This board answers to the community, and we will remind you that even when you try to silence us, Dr. Holm, happy pride to the board. Listen to these students who are calling for gender neutral bathrooms. It's important. Hi, board and superintendent. This is my eighth month coming here to ask why you continue to ignore the voices of our students and our community over the CRE contract. And some of you seem to you think you can use your power to disrespect students and constituents and to evade accountability over and over again. So I'm just here to remind you that we're not going away. 
um, that we're continuing to work to make sure that come November, trustees Acosta and Soto are replaced by folks who actually make decisions in the best interest of our students and are accountable to our community. I also wanted to ask where are the, the school budgets for the last two school years, because they're not on their site, you're, they're not on your website. Um, the last available financial documents are from the 2020, like 2021 to 2022 school year. And given that you're about to ask your constituents for another $315 million in school bonds, like where's the transparency on where you've been spending the public funds? So I hope you have those documents because we're going to follow up on that. Thank you. You know, the cost has been spending it on lawyers because she doesn't know what's going on. Uh, Bobby Pell is uh, watching real high, and the first thing I want to say is thank you to those board members who spoke up to defend my right to speak. Uh, I wish to speak on the CRE contract tonight. Uh, many months ago, I told you all that I felt an injustice had been done, and I was not going to let it go. It was an injustice when the board insinuated that Dr. Tintiango Kubales is anti-Semitic. It was an injustice when the board canceled the CRE contract without any evidence or input from teachers. And it was an injustice when the board ignored the pleas of the students that it served. And justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so I'm here tonight to remind you that I'm not going to let this go. Dr. Tintiango Kubala still deserves her apology. Staff still deserve to have CRE. And students still deserve to have their voices matter. I will continue to speak at these board meetings until you right these wrongs. And if you will not, I will do everything I can to find, to replace you with people who will. Support ethnic studies. Bring back CRE. Thank you. Good evening. For four months, many parents, students, and faculty have come before you asking for the CRE to be put on the agenda. At the same time, I've also made several requests to have items put on the agenda. And for 17 years, I and other public have asked for items to be put on the agenda. This board and its predecessors have turned a deaf ear to agenda requests. None have been done. This is a violation of the Brown Act. I told you this several times this year. I offered a remedy in the form of an agenda request to solve this issue, a change in the bylaws. You have stonewalled me and more than 100 other requests this year. In front of you is a letter to the district attorney along with the remedy. You serve the parents and students of this district, not the other way around. These are our schools, not yours. We expect you to listen to constructive criticism and act accordingly. Also, where's that study you're supposed to be doing on what schools we're going to close? You have to do it first before you go for a bond. Am I going to spend money repairing schools that are going to be closed? I don't think so. Why should I vote for your bond? I will move us to item 10.1 or 10 for employee organization comments. Now is the time that we hear from our employee organizations. Each will have five minutes. 10.1, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers, PVFT. And we have Ms. Vicara Boggs here this evening. Thank you. Good evening, board. Dr. Contreras, President Acosta. Um, well, happy summer. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm curious as to, I, I'm also curious as to why this board meeting was suddenly, um, there was an attempt to make it a special board meeting. I thought that special board meetings only had um, like pretty much one topic that would be discussed and yet we have like a full agenda. So I am curious as to what would have qualified it. So you can always email me and let me know because I'd really like to understand um, also, um, I just want to start with, um, you know, when we use the, the sacrifices that our veterans have made as a way to gaslight the very freedoms that we're trying to practice, it breaks trust and it is, it's just a gross move. Um, I have family, too, that are veterans. One uh, who my kids never got to meet because when he was 18, he went to Vietnam and never came back. Um, 
And they met, well, they met him at the Vietnam Memorial Wall in DC. So I just hope that you could take that to heart because the, the lives that people give of themselves, their lives, is important. And we still have people who are giving their lives for the, um, for the freedoms that we all stand for. So please don't disrespect that. Um, we have amazing CTE teachers. You got to meet one tonight. She's actually one of the CTE teachers that I took with me to Washington, D.C., not to New York, um, for, for those few days back in January for our CTE workshop with our national union. And um, she brings a wealth of information and delivers an amazing array of skill sets to our students. And it would be just not an efficient way to use to utilize her skill sets to have her teach a freshman health class. Not for any of our CTE, CTE teachers who not only are certificated, but they're, they have a very specific degree um, in, and skill set because they actually have that as a professional experience as well. Um, so I really do hope that we can sit down and discuss how to ensure that our students are acquiring their health units uh, they're for high school. And, um, and also, we would like to revisit the, very, the past votes we've had with our Watsonville High School and um, PB High School, where they had actually wanted to have a seven period day, which would afford the students the ability to have more choice. And that request, when we delivered that request to bargain to the district, they didn't really want to entertain that. As a matter of fact, they tried to take the seven period away from Aptos High, and we had to make sure to really put our feet down on like, you cannot do that, because we have contractual right to that seven period day since that was already bargained for. So in order to address all of the learning needs for our students this coming year, I'd like to have that conversation. Um, and I want our students to know that we are advocating for them because what we advocate, advocate for and what we bargain for in language in our contract directly impacts them. And having a sustainable workload makes our educators available and ready to meet the needs of our students. When you overburden an employee, their work, their work ability is, becomes exhausted. So we really need to sit down and have those conversations. And I know that Dr. Contreras, as she's moving in, into in, easing more into, into this role here in, in the PBUSD, I, I'm hopeful. I'm, I, I feel that she is making some efforts to have that um, collaborative uh, relationship with us. So um, I look forward to our, our community meeting. I would like to know the rationale for a special board meeting. Um, and I just want to also say congratulations to Denise Wheeler. She's an amazing teacher. She's going to be an incredible um, AC at McQuitty, and we're going to miss her as our member, but we're going to absolutely love working with her as an administrator. Thanks. Thank you, PBFT. Do we have anyone from CSEA? See none. How about uh, CWA? Seeing none, do we have anyone from Pavam? Seeing none, we will now move to item 11, a public hearing. I will now open the public hearing for item 11.1, SELPA Local Plan, Budget Service Plan, Governance and Administration. This report will be presented by our director, our SELPA Director of Special Services, uh, Heather Gorman. Okay. Good evening, President Acosta, Vice President Soto, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Contreras. <clears throat> Tonight's public hearing is to present SELPA's local plan, section E, D, and B. Hmm. Is that working? So as I start tonight's presentation, I want to ground this work on our collective vision of PVUSD and our LCAP goal, number four. The mission of PVUSD is to educate and support learners in reaching their highest potential. 
We prepare students to pursue successful futures and make a positive contribution to the community and global society. You want to see? Thank you. Sorry. So we believe that all students can learn and that students with disabilities must be guaranteed equal opportunity to become contributing members of society. And so in this slide, you see LCAP goal number four. In order to address the state priorities for students with disabilities, which include ELA and math, proficiency, least restrictive environment, targets, suspension rates, graduation rates, PBUSD will provide training in high quality curricular programs and coaching to create multi-tiered systems of support, focusing on improving academic achievement, continuing to build a continuum of services and implementation of an alternative graduation pathway. Next slide. So tonight I'll be presenting the annual service plan, the budget plan, and the governance and administration plan. This year's presentation includes additional content as section B is updated every three years. You might have noticed a lot of um, attachments. So slide five. The service plan includes a description of all the services we provide to students ages 0 to 22, and it outlines any services we provide with um, explanation. Our district is serving 2,969 um, students. Our numbers have remained about the same since last school year, um, with about less than fewer, uh, less than 60% fewer students. One area to note is that students with autism are now our third highest category, which has increased from last year. Next slide. So the prevalence of students with relatively severe disabilities has nearly doubled since 2019, primarily due to a notable rise for students with autism diagnosis. For our district, this translates to an increase from 176 students in 1920 to 314 students in 2024. Programs and services for students with severe disabilities are more costly compared to those of students with mild to moderate disabilities. Next slide. Our district provides over 42 unique services to our students, including some more common services, such as specialized academic instruction, speech and counseling, or less common services for students with low incidence disabilities, such as sign language, interpretation, respite care, and assistive technology. Our next session section of the plan is D, the annual budget. The PBUSD annual budget encompasses various sources of funding, including state aid from AB 602, federal funding from IDEA Part B, which supports school-aged children, federal funding from IDEA Part C, which caters to preschoolers, state funding for infant and toddlers, state funding for mental health initiatives, federal funding for mental health programs, and other revenue sources. As a single district SELPA, special education local plan area, serving students from birth to 22, our administrative unit is under the supervision of our superintendent and their designee. We hold the responsibility for ensuring that every eligible child receives appropriate services. Slide nine. So in accordance with the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, here is the California state breakdown for how a typical SELPA budget is funded. Approximately 31% of our funding originates from state revenues, while 9 to 10% is sourced from federal revenues, and the majority, about 60%, is derived from local contribution. So that's a state average right there. Slide 10. So general increases in staff and staff salaries and pension costs account for recent increases in special education expenditures. Additionally, there's been a rise in number of students with more severe disabilities, as I mentioned, specifically autism, which are more costly for, to provide services for. Next slide. For the 24-25 school year, our projected revenue breakdown is as follows. Approximately 29% or 18.5 million will come from state resources, around 8.5% or 5 million from federal government, and the majority of our funding, 62 or 93 million, will 
be contributed locally. If you recall from last year's presentation, this is an increase, which may prompt curiosity about the reason behind this jump. While I previously discussed the impact of our growing population of students with severe disabilities, there's another substantial change worth noting. Next slide. This year's total budget calculation includes the cost of transportation, which has led to a notable increase in our local contribution. Over the last two to three years, we made consistency with our local funding. Transportation was not included. However, with the additional 6.6 .6 million, or 4%, allocated for transportation, our local contribution has risen from 57.89% to 62%. It's also worth noting, if you look at this slide, I don't know why, if you can see it better, um, the funding has decreased from the federal government and also decreased from the state. Slide 13. So where do we spend our money? You'll notice that approximately 87% of the budget is allocated towards salaries and benefits. About 9% is directed towards operations, supplies, and services and the remaining 4% is designated for other expenses. So the final section of the local plan focuses on governance and administration. In crafting this segment, we actively sought input from parents through our community advisory committee, our LCAP meetings, and ensuring our procedures align with community needs and expectations. This section outlines the demographics, policies, procedures, and programs within PBUSD. It serves as a comprehensive guide detailing the administration and regionalized operations and services, as well as specific positions for students in our area. Next slide. So this section has a lot of attachments, you may have noticed, that were included in the supporting documents. I want to highlight just a few of the key points from the local plan. So as a SELPA director, my primary responsibility is to ensure that we are fully compliant with all federal, state, and local guidelines. This means staying up to date with regulatory changes and making sure our district adheres to these standards. Over the past few years, I've worked diligently to update and create several critical policies for our districts. These include graduation pathways, We've introduced new graduation pathways to better accommodate diverse needs for our students, ensuring that every student has a path to success. We've created an eligibility handbook. We developed a comprehensive eligibility handbook to standardize evaluation process, making it clear and more consistent for everyone involved. Independent evaluation process and policies. We've revised our independent education evaluation policies to ensure they are fair and transparent. Alternative dispute resolution policies. We've updated our procedures for resolving disputes to make the process more efficient and parent friendly in order to come to compromise prior to going to a due process hearing. And of course, these efforts are not undertaken in isolation. I work closely with our dedicated teaching staff, our school psychologists, our program directors, and program specialists. Lastly, I want to draw your attention to our updated procedural handbook. This is a state required document that has been updated to comply with specific guidelines. It serves as a comprehensive guide for our staff, detailing procedures and protocols to ensure consistency and compliance across the district. So, we have similar next steps, oh, and this is when I thought I was going after our other people, so as our um, local plan, so we have um, the local plans will be available to be looked at in the front office, and then on the June 26th, we hope to bring it back for adoption, and um, yep, that's it for that slide. Public comment and questions. Thank you, Ms. Gorman. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. We have one. Marilyn Garrett, you're up. Retired teacher who taught 20 years in this district. Every other elected body 
when anybody wants to speak, you just get up and line up. You don't fill out a card prior to the item. You have been addressing autism here. I want to recommend a book by a local author, Leon Canero, called The Unfortunate Truth About Vaccines, Exposing the Vaccine Orthodoxy. He was a school psychologist who worked in Head Start for 35 years and started seeing these autism cases and started investigating. The facts are in his book, and here are some important facts from Weston A. Price Foundation, Myths and Truths About Vaccines. Number of studies linking vaccines to neurological and autoimmune issues um, common to autism, 130. Is this two minutes or one minute or zero minutes? I think Your time is up, Ms. Garrett. Thank you. Your, your agenda says two minutes, right? So continuing with this, number Ms. Garrett, I'm sorry, but your time is up. Thank you. And that was our last public speaker? Yes. Okay, so I will now bring this back to the board for discussion questions, deliberations, and I'd also like to remind the board um, that this item is a public hearing tonight with no action being taken at this evening's board meeting. Any questions, comments, or deliberation from the board? Trustee bolano -Skow. Yes, thank you for that presentation. I just had a question on how uh, do we not notify parents currently um, of their rights uh, when they have a child in special education, or IAP, it's, we hear stories that some Areas of the district know their rights better than others. What obligation do we have to notify parents of their rights and, and how do we do that? Yeah, thank you for that question. That's great because we are obligated to notify parents of their rights at every annual IEP meeting. So it's part of our process with even being able to, the parents have to sign off that they receive their rights at those meetings. So part of like just checking to make sure that they did get that. Um, notification. It's also on our website, and we can uh, we do offer it at any IEP meeting, but we're obligated to offer it at the annual IEP meeting. Is it a piece of paper that? Y yes, it's a packet in Spanish and English. Thank you. That it, Trustee Bolanosco. Yes. Okay, thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Thank you uh, for the presentation. I know in, in the past we've, you know, we're talking about making sure that we're not over identifying students, but um, how are we ensuring that our students are getting the support and that we are identifying correctly? And that if our students don't need necessarily a special you know, SELPA services, that they are getting the services that they do need. Right. Another good question. Thank you. So there's a couple of ways we're looking at that, and that's one of the reasons why we put together the eligibility handbook, that special services, you qualify under 13 specific categories. So being consistent and training with the school psychologists, because they're one of the main um, people in the team. It's a team that it works together to identify needs. They work together and they have to really understand and know what they're testing and what the test results mean. So that's one way that we're ensuring that students are tested in all areas of suspected disability. Um, the other thing that we're doing as a district just to make sure that it's not a wait to fail model 
is that we're implementing MTSS throughout the district where we're looking at how do we support all of our students where they're at and that they're getting the supports they need prior to even having to come to special education. So those two pieces work together. Um, and then we also look at you know, our needs annually and retest if we have any other suspected areas. Sometimes we have students that come to us with speech and language needs, and then we're noticing that they're still not making academic progress, so we retest them to see if they have a specific you know, learning disability. Thank you, um, and I particularly appreciate hearing about the, I know we've had various you know, board presentations, et cetera, on the multi-tiered systems of support. Do I have the acronym correct? Mm -hmm. okay, thank you, sorry, just you know, that moment of, wait, do I? Yeah. Um, what I'm also curious about is with the increased numbers of you know, students with autism mm -hmm. that we've identified, is that, are we seeing an increase in the number of students with autism or identified? I, th I think both, because okay. it's not just in the state of California, there's nationwide, we're seeing increase of students with autism. Mm -hmm. And so we are, um, you know, I think we are getting better and better at identifying students. Mm -hmm. We also have, um, you know, students that have a medical diagnosis of autism mm -hmm. that don't necessarily qualify under the eligibility category for um, a student with autism for at a school site. So there's a, there is a difference, and I know that parents have a hard time sometimes understanding that difference and whether or not it's impacting their access to education. But in general, I think that it's both of the things that you said is that we are, we are better at identifying. Um, our preschool team has really worked hard and they use the ADOS to identify students with autism. And then we'd also have an increase of students with autism. Great. I, I appreciate that as well. That's it for my questions. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Trustee DeSerpa. Hi, Heather. Hi. Thank you for the presentation. It was um, short, but Sweet. I'm wondering if you could go back to the budget slides. I don't know if somebody could advance those. It's like <laughs> and the one maybe to, the, yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at this and just for clarification. No, no, no. So no, no, the no. state revenue, this is sort of a, these, this, this yeah. slide is a little confusing for I me. I know the slide what, this didn't look like this when I, put it on on my slide. So um, if you go back to that one with this, is it the three that you're looking at? Yeah, it's the so, three. It's okay. I, I, I think I can still ask my question. Okay. But at the bottom of the screen, it says no transportation, no transportation, then added this year. Mm -hmm. So had there been funding in the previous two years for transportation from the state and feds? Yes, we have been funding transportation. It is a service through special services that students qualify for. Sure. So we have to provide it. And I know Jenny and I talked about this before and I think she had some more um, information about why it wasn't added prior and now it is. So, so Jenny, was it, well anyway, I'll let you explain it and then I'll see if I understand. <laughs> sure. So. Um, through the federal IDA mandate, um, all students are, um, they have their right to a free and public education. So part of that is if you have an IEP that mandates uh, transportation, the school district is required to provide that. Sure. Um, prior to um, LCFF, um, uh, so back before the implementation in 2013, school districts um, through uh, revenue limits used to get specific funding for transportation. When LCFF was implemented, um, essentially it kind of went away and what um, all school districts have to do is they use their regular LCFF base funding um, to support the special education transportation. So prior- um, That's state funding we're talking state fund about. Uh, lo yes, state funding mm -hmm. and local funding. So. Um, uh, PVUSD has always paid for uh, special education transportation out of the unrestricted general fund. Um, it is still part of our overall special education costs and it's part of what we report in the year end maintenance of effort reporting for special education. So prior to, I think this year, 
Um, I think in the year-end reporting, it wasn't getting captured. So kind of going forward. In terms of our contribution to the total contribution. The mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So now what we're saying is um, because we wanted to align with the annual maintenance of effort reporting, and we truly want to capture um, this is what our special education um, program is actually um, kind of costing in the local contribution. So to kind of provide a more accurate viewpoint, um, what that total is is now the unrestricted to restricted contribution. So that is an actual accounting term. And then the portion that is paid out of the unrestricted general fund. So I think um, sometimes we get confused with the word contribution because it's an actual accounting term. But when we think about it in terms of what is actually getting paid out of the total unrestricted general fund, that's kind of what we have to look at for the ongoing maintenance of effort. So just, so just for clarity's sake, I understand we're accounting for it differently. Mm -hmm. Are we spending 6.6 .6 million more than we were before? No, or no, um, it's just being it's just being attributed now. Okay, mm -hmm. it's being attached to special education at this point, which mm -hmm. it was always supporting us, but it wasn't in these presentations. And does that do us any good in our? I mean, well, I, I know it supports our maintenance of effort, for example, but does it do us any good to pull down extra money from the federal government or state funding for? No, no. Okay. So, um, no. So, it's just, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, I appreciate You're that. Thank you, Trustee DeServe. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Ms. Gorman. Thank you. I will now close this public hearing. We will now move to um, our action items, 12.1, Pajaro Valley Memorandum of Understanding for Summer School Administrator Stipend for the Summer School of 23, 24, is that? Yes, yes, that is correct, <laughs> sorry. Um, and this report will be presented by Dr. Heather Contreras, Superintendent of PBUSD Schools. Good evening. Uh, this memorandum of understanding is an agreement that we have to support our administrators in summer school and administration and the duties that are associated with, with that through our ELOP summer program. Uh, this includes our breakfast club, summer school, and the after school programs that happen during the summer. Um, and the stipend basically acknowledges the increased workload and dedication it takes to run the nine to 10 hours of programming per day that's required by the ELOP funding and, and having these programs at the site. So we are looking at compensating our administrators with a stipend of $3,500. Um, for the ELP work, ELOP work, the stipend will be paid at the conclusion of the summer when all the duties have been fulfilled, and it will be prorated based on the number of days worked. So if someone's not there, then th that would be accounted for, and they wouldn't remain, they wouldn't have the full stipend. So we're asking for approval of this MOU. The effective period is for the 2023-2024 summer school year. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. Do we have any public speakers on this item? We have one, Marilyn Garrett. Is she still here? I'm in favor of the stipend. Also, with any school program, would you allow uh, people smoking 24-7 in the school environment? because the Wi-Fi microwave radiation has similar or perhaps worse damage. I'm looking at this item here that says goal three, positive and supportive culture, and goal four, develop human capital. Uh, to have a positive and supportive culture, you need a health-promoting environment where children and staff are not assaulted by toxic technology. Wire technology, like Ethernet, does not have this problem. The technology be, should be changed to wire technology. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. I will now bring this item back to the board for discussion, questions, and deliberation. 
Any questions or comments from the board? Trustee DeSerpa? Can our district afford these stipends? Yes. <laughs> okay. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. I have a first and second. Any other questions, comment, distribute? Uh, Trustee Bolanoscao. Well, I, I think it's a, a great idea. Sometimes we have administrators ask about additional um, income opportunities, and there was a problem in the past where there was a miscommunication over this, and uh, we lost some good people. And so thank you for being proactive and, and bringing this to us. So look forward to voting for it. Thank you. Any other discussions or questions or comments? All right, seeing none, I have a first and second. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. And we will now move to item 12.2, our memorandum of understanding between PVSD and CSEA Chapter 132 Transportation Stipend for Summer School 2023-2024. And this report will be presented by Dr. Contreras, our superintendent of PVUSD Schools. And good evening. This is another memorandum of understanding to support another group of um, workers who help us with summer school. This is for the transportation department to offer a stipend reward for drivers who are willing to take on additional work to help with the summer school transportation. Uh, we are looking at a stipend of $2,000 given to drivers who choose to work summer school. Um, as well as a stipend of $1,500 for drivers who will pick up extra routes, um, do other pieces of the work, including fueling the buses, dispatching the buses, and mechanical work that might be needed during summer school. So this is another MOU to honor that work and um, to show a demonstration of our appreciation for our drivers who are willing to do this extra work. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. All right, seeing none, I will bring it back to the board for questions, comments, deliberation. I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. I'll second. I have a first and second. Any other questions or comments or deliberations? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. Thank you. Um, our, so our next upcoming board meetings is our next meeting is a special board meeting on Thursday, June 20th, 24, here in the city council chambers, followed by another special board meeting on Saturday, June 22nd, 2024, and our regular next board meeting will be held on June 26th, 2024, here in the city council chambers as well, and this meeting is now adjourned at 8.30 p.m. Thank <laughs> you.